Today I'd like to talk about what Jesus said about the second coming. And uh, get your Bibles and uh, look at chapter 17 of the book of Luke. Luke chapter 17. And uh, of course Luke is 17 is a big long chapter. Uh, so we can't preach on all of it. But uh, you, you can read between the lines and read while I leave out some of the scriptures. But uh, there's several scriptures here I'll be going through today about what Jesus said about the second coming. And if you're not a Christian today, Jesus is coming and you need to obey the gospel before it's too late. I don't know when he'll come, but he's coming. He said he was and he'll be here. Count on it. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for this day that we've had. Thank you for uh, Morgan's song and uh, Lord, just uh, what a great message in that in that song, in the songs and what he said today. And Lord, thank you for all these people here today. And just pray that you'll bless them, God, that they'll receive a blessing. And uh, as we preach your word and that they've already said it's received a blessing today. Lord, be with us. Open our hearts and our minds and let me remember the things that I've studied here in the word of God. Give me the wisdom that I need. And God, uh, pray for those who are outside of Christ today that they'll do exactly what Morgan said. They, they'll hear the word, they'll believe the word, and they'll confess that Jesus is Christ, they'll repent of their sins, and they'll be baptized today for their mission of their sins to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now bless us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Think about what Jesus said about the second coming. And uh, I think I left my glasses down there. Coming in the car. <coughs> Thank you, Shannon. I didn't need those 20 years ago. Uh, but anyway, let's look at the scripture in Luke. Our text is taken from Luke 17, 22. And it says, And he said unto the disciples, The days would come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. You know, think about that. Uh, those days will come when we want to see the Lord's coming. Now, when you consider that, you're talking about his return. He's going to return. He's coming just like he went into the clouds. He said, if I go away and he went into the clouds, they said, I'll come again. And we know he went into the clouds of glory and he said, I'll come back just as I went. And someday he's going to appear. In Luke 17, 23 and 24, and they shall say to you, lo there, lo here, follow out not after them. For as the lightning, when it lighteth out of one part of the heaven, shineth unto the other part of the heaven, so shall the Son of Man be in his day. Now, when we see lightning, there's always usually a clap of thunder that follows. Boom. Peter says the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night and the heavens will pass away with a great noise. He said the elements would melt with fervent heat and be burned up. The great noise must be the sound of a celestial thunder that'll tend the Lord's lightning fast return. So when we hear the second coming, we hear the trumpet sound, we hear the great noise, and we hear and we begin to see all those things begin to happen. We know the Lord's on his way and it's going to be lightning, like lightning as soon as the, the lightning can come from the east to the west. And he says that we are to look for and earnestly desire the coming of the day of God. So when things look bad in this world and because of violence and drugs and wars and disease, it's only natural for us as Christians to desire the coming day of the Lord. I hope you look forward to that day. Our prayer should be at times in the words of Peter, Oh, Lord, let the elements be dissolved with fervent heat. Lord, let the heavens pass away with a great noise. Lord, let the earth and the works therein be burned up. And as Jesus promised, 
let the sun be turned to blood. I mean, let the sun be turned into darkness. Let the moon be turned into blood. Let the heavens be removed as a scroll when it's rolled together. Let the stars fall from heaven as a fig tree which cast her unripe figs which is shaken by a mighty wind. Let the Lord discern the sin. Let the shout be heard. Let the voice of the archangel be uttered. Let the trumpet sound. Let the dead in Christ be raised up first. Let those of us who remain be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air in our resurrected, glorified bodies and let death be swallowed up in victory. This is our prayer. This is our desire. This should be our wish. In Jesus' name, amen. However, when Jesus told the apostles of his return, remember what he said? He says that first he must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. Oh, is he rejected today, isn't he? He was rejected then, he's rejected today. And now the Lord tells next what the days will be like before he returns. Those days that make us long to see him coming again. He instructs us by comparing those days with the days of three individuals. The three are Noah, Lot, and Lot's wife. First, the Lord spoke of the days of Noah. He said, the days of Noah and the days of the Son of Man. Luke 17, 26 says, And it came to pass in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. Now, what was it like in the days of Noah? Moses said, And God saw that the wickedness of man's imagination and his thoughts were evil continually. And then the earth also, he says, Moses says, was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. Peter says Noah was a preacher of righteousness and evidently no one paid any attention to Noah. Although he preached for 120 years, he had the Bible in one hand and the hammer in another hand, preaching and trying to get people to get on the ark because they were ungodly people, what were they like there? What was these people that kept them from not wanting to get on the ark? Peter says, Noah was a righteous man. These words give us some sense. That is the spiritual conditions of the people of Noah's day. What were they like? For one thing, the Bible says they were violent people. Their imaginations, their heart was evil continually. Violence is one of the characteristics of people just before his return. We live in a violent society, don't we? We hear of people getting shot, killed, raped, murdered. Remember these people back in did not have atomic bombs in Noah's day. They had no gunpowder. They had no shotguns. They had no machine guns. They didn't have any dynamite. They didn't have any of our modern day methods of killing each other. Yet the Bible says they're people of violence and they, that God brought the flood on the world because of their ungodly ways. They're violent people. Evidently, the laws that we make about gun control and the sale of guns are, is just a moot question. And here's why I say that. If people, took, if you took all the bombs and all the machine guns, and all the dynamite, and all the shotguns, and all the uh, any kind of gun or any kind of weapon, you took it all the way, people would still kill each other. Because men would fight with sticks, they would fight with rocks, they'll fight with anything. And that's the way it was in Noah's day. And is there any serious question in anyone's mind that we live in perilous times? How much more is our potential for violence today than it was in Noah's day? The Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Another characteristic of the people in Noah's day were they the thoughts of men's hearts were evil continually. You know, it must be the opinion of the television and advertisers that we people are 
the most unlearned and ignorant people who think only of dirty things all the time. Look at the shows that we see on TV. Look at the porn magazines. They're specially made for spiritually and sexually depraved people. And the TV, look at the things that in your windows and the things. You know, uh, if you ever watch Two and a Half Men, I always turn it off because all they think about is that guy going to the bedroom with another woman and they advertise it like it's the greatest thing in the world. Man, I tell you, we live in a sexually depraved world. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Another condition of Noah's day and the day of the Lord is all flesh had corrupted themselves. You know, I read a story about two unmarried college students who were living together. And the boy said he did the ironing and that the girl, she did the cooking. He said they may or may not get married. Now, most of us won't have to look very far to see the same situation in your family or the church. It happened in my family. Of course, young adults today, they snicker at us as Christians. They laugh at us and they say, we live in the 21st century. That's the way it is today. You try a pair of shoes and if you don't like them, you take them back and get you another pair you like. And that's the way it is with sexual couples today. We'll live together. We'll try it out. If it don't work, well, we'll just go get another one. We live in a depraved sexual society. They smile at us. They think we're old-fashioned because they think that's the way the world's supposed to be today. Two consenting adults, they say we have a relationship and that makes it okay. I'm telling you, the moral commands of the Word of God have never been up for a vote for majority. God's Word has never changed. God is not governed by what the polls say. We live in a time when all flesh has corrupted themselves as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. And then I, I just want to repeat another thing. Just the same thing. When we think about the fourth thing. The day of the Lord is all flesh. It said another condition of the Lord's day is the same as it was. And it never ended. The day of the Lord is, is all flesh had corrupt themselves. You know what God told Noah? He said, I'll bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, all man, everything. And he told Noah, he said, I want you to go out and I want you to build an ark. Noah believed the Lord. Noah believed that God was going to come and it was going to rain and that the world was going to be destroyed by a flood. In the roll call of great people of faith, he said, by faith, Noah being Warned of God concerning things not seen as yet moved with godly fear. He prepared an ark to the saving of his house. While Noah built the ark, like I said, he had the Bible in one hand and a hammer in the other. People tell us Noah was a preacher of righteousness who spared with seven others when God brought the flood on In other words, the only people he saved was his family. He was the most unsuccessful preacher ever lived. The only people that he got out of that flood was him, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. Eight people were saved, the Bible says, by water. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the son of man. And then the days of Lot and the days of the son of man. That's the second example. In Luke 17, 28, it says, Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sowed, they planted, they built it. What was it like in the days of Lot? Both Jude and preacher uh, Peter give us some insight on old Lot. Jude said, even as Sodom and Gomorrah in the cities about them in the like manner giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of the eternal fire. Peter said, Lot was vexed with a filthy lifestyle of the wicked. 
For that righteous man dwelt among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. I guess if you looked at Sodom, you'd say, well, Sodom is sin city. Sodom was sin city. Suppose your city was well known for its distilleries and they would called it Whiskey City. And the street where you lived was on the corner of Booze and Drunkard Streets. Now, whenever you read of the city of Sodom in the Bible, everybody knows what made them famous or infamous. Somosexuality. That's how they become famous. Whichever the case may be. But anyway, and remember Jesus said, but the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. That's the way it was in the days of Lot. The way it is now and the way it will be in the day that the Son of Man will be revealed. The moral fiber of people in both cases have been shredded and had been disintegrated. You remember old Lot, Abraham, here they are. Abraham comes to Lot and, he's, and their herdsmen have been fussing and feuding over getting her herds mixed up and over the cattle. And so Abraham, he comes to Lot and he says, Oh, buddy Lot, I don't want us to quarrel over this. I don't want us to fight over this. He said, I'll tell you what I do. We'll divide. Whatever way, whatever you want, I'll take the other. That's how humble that this man was. And Abraham was willing to give Lot whatever he wanted. And so Lot, you remember the story, Lot looks at the plains of Jordan. He says, oh, they're well watered. The grass is green. Everything looks pretty over here. I'll take that. And I'll get separated from that old Abraham's herd and I'll have my own herd. And they can all eat good grass. And so he turned his face toward the plains of Jordan, which was toward Sodom. And so Abraham, being the humble man he was, he took the other way. And that was the biggest mistake that Lot probably made right there when he chose the plains that headed towards Sodom. Every thought that the soul of righteous Lot says was vexed by the lifestyle of the Sodomites. He did not seem to be in any hurry to leave the city. Moses tells why, why, why Lot lingered. You know, remember, uh, Abraham had prayed, Lord, if we find 50 people righteous in the city or 40 or 30, you remember the story. He got all the way down to 10 people. Lord, if we could find 10 righteous people. Abraham went to bat for Lot. And the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, Lord, if there's just 10. God said, Abraham, I'll spare the city for 10 righteous people. They could not find 10, but they did find four. Because the angels took him and his daughters and his wife. And they left the city. It led them by the hand to lead them out of the city. And you know what they, he said? The angel said, escape for your life. Perhaps he lingered. Perhaps old Lot didn't want to leave the city because he, had, he didn't want to leave that nice house he lived in. He didn't want to leave the new television, the new car, and all the money in the bank. Think of that nice boat that was going to go up in flames. And Lot lingered. He wasn't excited to leave the city. He did not want to leave the city but he thought I'm going to lose all my material things what a waste and a lot of people feel the same way and the angel said escape for the life you know when Jesus comes and the world begins to burn with fervent heat and everything begins to move around and the heavens begin to roll up and I tell you what you're not going to have time to grab a boat or a bag of money or anything that you got that you thought was precious. You're not going to be able to drive that new car. It'll be gone. You'll have to leave it. And you'll hear 
The words escape for your life. Perhaps he was reluctant to leave so many of his family members there. Maybe he had more family members. He had friends. And no doubt they used his lingering for what they thought was his hypocrisy. Look at the old fool, they probably said. He says this place will burn down. But he doesn't seem to be in any hurry to get out. I don't think he believed it himself. He still was hanging around. The angel said, escape for the life. Sometimes the church seems to linger in evangelism and winning souls to Christ. When we should be crying out to a world of sin, escape for the life. Escape for a life. If you're a sinner here today, if you're not a child of God, if you never obeyed this gospel, I'm telling you, you need to escape for your life. Jesus is coming. There needs to be a sense of urgency in the invitation that we give to people and we need to lay it on the line and tell them to escape for the life. In most congregations, the emphasis on making the assembly feel comfortable when we should be preaching, escape for your life, because you're going to go to hell without Jesus. Escape for the life. I want to remind you of the terms of pardon laid down by Peter on the day of Pentecost to help you escape. It says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The message should come through loud and clear for those who want to go to heaven. Escape for the life. Now I want to talk about Jesus' mentions regarding his turn was Lot's wife. She don't even have a name. Lot's wife in the days of the Son of Man. I don't even know Lot's wife's name, do you? Maybe it was Isabel, maybe it was Sup uh, Sophie. I don't know. Doesn't even say. The Lord said in Luke 17, 32. I think that Chris said that Dorothy was an angel. I think Lot's wife was a pretty good woman. I think she was an angel. And uh, I told him, the Doug, I said, you know, I heard the story said, my wife's an angel. She's always up there harping about something. Now, Lot's wife was a pretty good girl. What can we remember about this woman? Remember her because she lost for all eternity in spite of the fact that she was a member of a saved community. She no doubt was person acquainted with Uncle Abraham. And I'm sure she'd heard Abraham. And I know she'd heard Abraham talk about God and talk about how God loved them. Yet she was lost. Remember Lot's wife. Remember, in spite of the fact that she was married to a pious husband, Peter said he was called righteous Lot. Lot was a righteous man. The Bible says it, it says it two or three times. Yet she could, but she could not ride to heaven on the coattails of Lot, even though he was righteous. Remember Lot's wife, God says. Why does he want us to remember Lot's wife? Why did he put those three little words in a verse? Remember her because she entertained heavenly visitors. She brought some heavenly visitors right into her home. Two angels spent the night with her family. And yet Lot's wife was lost. We also have entertained a heavenly visitor, you and I. Many a person has received Jesus into their life. They've obeyed the gospel of Jesus. They've received the gift of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But they have like Lot's wife, have fallen away. Remember Lot's wife. Jesus had something to say about that. In Luke 9, 62, he said, No man that put his hands to the plow and looketh back, he says, fit for the kingdom of heaven. When you walk down this aisle, when you gave your life to Jesus, when you're baptized into Christ, I should, we should have the attitude, from this point, I'm going forward. I'm not going to look back. I want to head toward heaven. But a lot of people have fallen away. Remember her. She looked back. From behind. Lot's wife disobeyed God. God said you get out of the city. Take these. Get out of the city because I'm going to destroy it. And you know can you imagine. Here's Lot. And his wife. And his two daughters. And I, I'm sure that they couldn't help but. Glance over their shoulders. All this fire and brimstone was destroyed in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm sure that they probably glanced over their shoulder 
but she turned around. She didn't want to leave. I think Lot's wife turned around and she probably started back and all of a sudden, boom! She was turned into a pillar of salt. The historian Josephus said he saw it. He saw her pillar. He saw that pillar of salt as he would walk by. You know, when God says something, he means it. Remember the Ark of the Covenant? When they're trying to get a horse and buggy and pull in the, the Ark of the Covenant, instead of carrying it on the poles like they were supposed to, they were trying to pull it with a horse and buggy that, like we would put it in the back of the truck. It started to fall. Remember? It was shaken. It started to fall. And Uzziah tried to keep it from falling. It was about to fall. And he went like that just to stabilize it. And what happened? Boom. He was struck dead right there. God says, don't touch it. God told him not to touch it. When God says something, he means it, people. Many a person, she was leaving Solomon Gomorrah, but Solomon Gomorrah had not left Lot's wife. She was leaving, but it hadn't left her. You know, many a person has come into the fellowship of the church of Christ, and they've left the world, but the world has not left them. They fall behind. They fall behind in Bible reading. They fall behind in prayer. They fall behind in faithfulness. They fall behind in attendance. They fall behind in the observance, uh, observance of the Lord's Supper. They fall behind in their dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember Lot's wife. If you're headed down that spiritual road, don't look back. Keep going. As you read this account, some of them might notice that the Lord did not mention the sins listed in the Old Testament. His comment was the conditions of the last days regarding some things that don't appear wrong. They did eat, they drank, they married, wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And you could read the rest. But he mentioned such things as eating and drinking. He spoke of marrying and giving in marriage. Then again, how about what he said about buying, selling, planting, and building? We say, well, and I ask myself, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with marrying? You know, they all are things seem necessary. Planting, selling, building. What was wrong with marrying? There are a few people left today who actually go to the trouble getting a license and having a marriage ceremony, believe it or not. Now, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with planting? If farmers don't plant, you and I will starve to death. If farmers don't plant this year, we're all in real trouble. We won't get to go into uh, Food City and buy two cans of corn for a dollar. I think sometimes. Or we won't get to go in and buy the stuff that we need if farmers don't plant. What's wrong with that? What is wrong with buying and selling? I'd hate to think that if I went to the supermarket, I'd find the supermarket down at Food City with a padlock on it. And then they said, well, I'm sorry, we cannot sell. And you cannot buy. What's wrong with buying a house or a car? What's wrong with selling these things? Nothing. Then why did Jesus bring it up? Well, there are two reasons. Can you go back, Carol? There are two reasons. First of all, the nature of people have not changed. Jesus went to back to the days before the flood thousands of years ago to show us that the nature of people has not changed. They ate, they drank, they planted, they bought, they sold, they married, they were given in marriage, and then they committed the same sins that people do today. We are more polished. We have invented things for a lifestyle that would have boggled the minds of the people in the ancient days. But we're no better. Nothing has changed about our human nature. They were on a collision course with destruction. And many today are on that same collision course. And I'm asking you today to turn around to Jesus. Come to him. The second reason Jesus mentioned these things is because it's all right. 
things that are all right in themselves was point out the fact that these ancients were just like us also because to them all these good things were a way of life. They thought, let the good times roll. They'll never end. They won't forever. Nothing can stop it. That includes my house, my car, my family, my money, my sports team, my television pros, my movies, my job. This is the sum total of life of people. It goes on and on and we think it's going to be endless. And, and, and then one day, surprise, surprise, surprise. In the days of Noah, it started to rain. The floods came. And surprise. What happened? They drowned. Think about what we've been through. And the flood came in Noah's day. The fire consumed Simon and Mar. Think about our day. The Twin Towers fell and Americans begin to get on their knees and they get antsy for a few days and, and they begin to pray all over the nation because they think here they come. I remember when that happened, I was on the radio at WNRG over there and, and the Twin Towers fell and the guy in the window kept motioning and I kept going. I didn't know what he meant. And then he said, come in here and we watched it. And people, I remember... If you remember in Elkhorn City, I was living in Elkhorn City at that time, we was all lined up at the gas station at Bailiff's. Remember? There was a line all the way up the street there trying to get gas because we thought there'd never be no more gas. So we thought it was really going to come to an end in this world and we was just going to get blasted off the map. And we began to pray. People began to go to the churches. We had special meetings of prayer. And God saved us you know the biggest sin of all is greater than all their violence their corruption their perversion the greatest sin of all is that they like us live with no preparation for eternity there's one statement jesus made regarding lot's wife that needs emphasis he said it six times and twice in matthew once in mark twice in luke once in john he said it that many times. Here's what he said. He repeated it more than any other statement that he made while upon this earth. I don't know if you knew that or not, but Jesus said, Whosoever shall seek to gain his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, it's the same. Shall find it. If we're willing to lose everything for Christ, we can be saved. My friends, we got to give it up. We got to give up the swirl if we want to go to heaven and start your journey today, but don't look back. How long can God endure the stench, the foul odor, the drug infested place, the sports crazed people, sexually perverted people, and the violent and pleasure mad people? There's, how long will he allow it to go on? How long will he allow it to happen until he breaks through the clouds and we hear the trumpet of God sound? Luke 17, 30 said, Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. It's in the days like these that Jesus referred to when he says, If I go, I'll come again. My friends, if you're not a Christian today, we're going to stand and sing our invitation hymn. And we know the Bible says that Jesus is coming. And I want you to get prepared for eternity as we stand and as we sing.